Happy Easter. I want to make sure to say that to you this second Sunday of Easter because the world may have moved on. All the candy from Easter might be on clearance at the stores you go to. But we in the church know Easter continues. It continues on not only for the 40 days we celebrated in high honor in the church, but now it continues on forever, which is why we say in joyous tones, Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Our joy continues today because the events of two weeks ago changed things forever. Today, our gospel reading from John 20 highlights one of the specific aspects of our Easter joy, and that is peace. Peace is a sought-after state. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as freedom from disturbance, tranquility. In an age of anxiety, I think everybody is in search of this state, this freedom from disturbance and tranquility. But there are a lot of people who don't find it. According to the latest statistics, nearly 30% of all adults in America report having anxiety problems. And nearly half of those 30% are people between the ages of 18 and 24. There are growing wars and conflicts around the world, and our society seems to be more divided and fighting than any other time in recent history. Anxiety is the body's response to fear. And most often, this is specifically the fear of the unknown. We like to be in control, and when we don't know what's going to happen, and we don't have a lot of influence over how things will go, we get afraid. That might be part of the reason why it seems that younger people are more afraid than older people, because there's a lot more that is unknown to them that lies before them. But I think something deeper is happening here that causes that anxiety, and I kind of alluded to it in my children's messages. The perception of a lot of people is that the world is on fire. The place around them, whether it's the building they're in, the life they inhabit, the family they're born into, the country they live in, they all feel like it's something's deeply wrong and falling apart, and despite our best efforts, we can't seem to piece it together. There's lots of different opinions on how that should work and what that should look like, but one thing that's always struck me that most people agree on is something's not right. The solutions where we differ but the problem is usually pretty universally agreed on. Well, our second Sunday of Easter, our gospel reading, finds the disciples in such a situation. The world as they know it has exploded before their eyes. The one they put all their faith in, dead and gone. The text even tells us that they're afraid. It doesn't really highlight the big stuff, although we kind of see that behind things. It says that they're afraid of the Jews. They just have seen what they've done to Jesus, the one who they thought was the Messiah, and now they think because of their association with him, they're next. So they're hiding behind locked doors. And in the midst of this situation of fear and anxiety about what comes next, in the midst of feeling powerless... Jesus appears among them, and He does what He always does whenever He enters a situation. He comforts, puts fears to rest, men's broken hearts. He brings peace amidst all their fears. That's why the first thing He says to them when He appears is, peace be with you. And so he says to you today, as you sit in your pew, peace be with you. Now, you may have noticed during the reading, Jesus says this three times. Anytime Jesus says something three times, we ought to pay attention, especially in such short sequence. But this seemingly simple phrase, peace be with you, carries with it even more meaning than we could imagine, even more meaning than the disciples themselves at that moment in time really understood, but they could probably feel it. After all, it's not every day you see somebody who is dead and is now alive. 
So I imagine that they maybe didn't know what had changed, but they knew something major had changed. Now, the first time Jesus says this in verse, is in verse 19, and it's part of the setup for the scene. It addresses the most obvious fear that is plaguing the disciples, their, quote, fear of the Jews. They're afraid that the same thing is going to happen to them that happens to Jesus. And it really has been this way for them since his arrest. And we see examples of that most famously with Peter, who has said, somebody says, Arnold, you're one of his disciples. We saw you with him. Oh, no, 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 I don't know him at all, right? And he denies him three times because he's afraid. He's afraid he's next. Well, they succeeded. They put down Jesus. And so now all the disciples are in the same place that Peter was when he made those denials. They're afraid. This fear of human adversaries is one that we all know as well. People in our lives, our schools, our workplaces who work against us or just disagree with us. It can even be the same fear that the disciples have. Fear of being found out that you're one of those people that believes in Jesus and actually takes Him at His word. We're afraid because we don't know what will happen if they find that out. If this person or the people find out that I believe in Jesus, I could lose friends, maybe my job, or at the very least, my reputation. I'll be one of those believers. Well, how does Jesus deal with this fear His disciples are plagued by? Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. He doesn't leave them alone in their fear, but instead He enters into the situation. Notice the disciples, they're not praying, they're not calling out to God, and yet Jesus comes among them. You'll find throughout this text, and really throughout all of Scripture, God always makes the first move. Well, Jesus does this for you as well. Now, He doesn't appear in the same way directly and bodily, and invites you, as he does later in this text for Thomas, to touch the wounds in his hand and in his side. But he does come to you and stand among you. He's doing it right now. Through his word that he has shared with you, and through the gift of his son's body and blood, through the gift of the promises of baptism, Jesus comes among you and stands and says, peace be with you. Now, I mentioned before that more is happening than the obvious, right? It would be great enough if Jesus was just going to be addressing our earthly fears of other people and the situations of our lives and our jobs, but if we're being honest, we have deeper fears than that. Remember the context of Jesus came and stood among them. Jesus was dead the last they saw, and this is the first appearance in the book of John of the resurrected Lord to His disciples. They've been told by Mary Magdalene from a few verses before, where she encounters the gardener and doesn't recognize Jesus, and then He says her name, and she knows who He is, and then He tells her to go tell them, but they, like Thomas, they don't believe. They probably think that she's gone crazy from grief or something. So this is the context into which Jesus appears and stands among His disciples. His presence and His peace means so much more than just addressing their fear of the Jews. To understand this deeper meaning, let's look at the full fear the disciples were experiencing. They aren't just afraid of, for their own lives, for fear of the Jews. They were also afraid because they'd, to, so to speak, put all their eggs in the Jesus basket. And at this point in time, they're thinking that was a mistake. He wasn't who he said he was. He's dead. He was the Messiah. He was the long-awaited Savior of the people of God, or so they thought. But now all their belief and hope is shattered, not just the hope in dealing with earthly adversaries, but the hope they'd placed in him solving all of the great questions of existence the purpose of their life. It's not an exaggeration to say the disciples were experiencing an existential crisis. How can He have been the Messiah if He died? And if He died, we were wrong about 
everything. C.S. Lewis is famous for saying that Jesus was one of three things. He was either a liar, a loon, or the Lord. And sitting in that locked room, the disciples are thinking probably that Jesus is either a liar or we followed a crazy person until Jesus came and stood among them. In the midst of their despairing fear, their growing anxiety about the great abyss of life opening in front of them, Jesus comes and stands among them. And so when He stands there and says, peace be with you, He's not just bringing a peace to the small earthly fears that are bound to this life, but to the great horror behind questions such as, why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? How come there's so much suffering in the world, and why doesn't God do anything about it? What can I do? What does the future hold? The reality of Christ's resurrection drastically changes the answers to all of those questions from ones of confusion and despair to joy and hope and, yes, peace. Because prior to this, we thought we had to do all the difficult work, that if it's going to be, it's up to me, that I'm going to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. We'll see where that leaves us. It leaves us cowering in a room behind locked doors, paralyzed by fear. And into that space, Jesus comes. Have you ever felt this fear before? Fear about your future. Maybe you're worried about small future fears like, is there someone out there for me and will I be able to get married? Or will I get into the school I want? Or am I going to be able to find a good job and provide for myself and my family? Now, those may not seem like small fears, but they really are. They're small compared to what's the point of my life? What's the purpose of the work that I do? What difference does it make? What's going to happen to me when I die? What's happened to my loved ones who have died? Will I ever see them again? They're friends in Christ, just as He does in our text today with His disciples. Today, Jesus comes and stands among you. And His very presence declares your future is secure. The answer to all those questions is in Him. And He's coming to you with grace and peace and life. Now, why does it answer all those questions? Because by the act of raising Jesus from the dead, God affirmed everything Jesus said about Himself that He's the Son of God, about you, that God loves you even though you're sinners and has forgiven all of your sin because of the sacrifice of His Son, and that He comes to you to bring you new life. It's all true. Why? Because Jesus is risen. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Now, just when you think Jesus is done bringing comfort and peace, He keeps going. He proactively addresses all of the fears of His disciples. It would be jarring all of a sudden to see someone you thought dead standing in front of you. Many thoughts would probably occur to you before you would think, oh, so this is my friend who's dead and is now alive. Maybe it's a ghost. Maybe someone who just looks like Jesus. They also might not recognize Him at all. After all, Mary Magdalene, who's been with Jesus for a long time and knows Him very well, she, she claims that He saved her life, and He did. She stood face to face with the resurrected Jesus and had no idea who He was. So what does Jesus do? He does what He always does for us. When He said this, He showed them His hands and His side. He reassures them that, in fact, He is the very same Jesus. They've been following all this time. The very same Jesus who was crucified and is now risen from the dead. The text says it's only then the disciples were glad that they saw the Lord. They recognized Him because Jesus made Himself known. 
just as He has done so graciously to all of us. Then Jesus repeats to them, peace be with you. He sends them, then He gives them one more comfort and reassurance, the Holy Spirit. And after He sent them, it says, He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. The forgiveness that Jesus had just won on the cross, He now gives to His disciples, the church, so that they, by the power of the Holy Spirit, are given the authority to bring this very same peace, the peace of the Lord, to one another, to all those who would believe. The peace of Christ is the peace of the resurrection. It is the peace of the forgiveness of sins. That's why throughout the history of the church we've shared a greeting of peace. Because we believe in a new world order where Christ is risen from the dead, where all the great big questions of life have found their answer in Him, where death doesn't win, but life wins. Why? Because Jesus rose from the dead. Now, the comfort of the text continues with the story of disbelieving Thomas, which you're probably all very familiar with. Because when Jesus first appears to His disciples, He's not there. And just like when Mary Magdalene told all of them that she had seen the Lord and they didn't believe, Thomas doesn't believe either. Despite all that God had done for Thomas and Jesus, he doesn't believe, and he even goes as far to make an ultimatum and a demand in order for his, if you want to win my belief, God, you're going to have to do this. And he says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and not just see them, but place my finger into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Can you imagine hearing that from Jesus' perspective, all that he's just done for this guy, and he's got gall, the gall to make such a demand. But what does Jesus do in the face of this outrageous demand from some ungrateful sinner who just doesn't know anything? Jesus comes into his midst and stands in front of him, and he says a third time, peace be with you. But for Thomas, he goes even further. He meets this unreasonable, arrogant, and outrageous demand and says, put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And by the grace of God, Thomas believes and confesses his faith, my Lord and my God. But think of how humble, loving, and gracious Jesus is here to meet. And it doesn't indicate to us that it was any, there was any difficulty for Jesus to do this. In fact, he, ends his implor he implores Thomas, don't disbelieve, but believe. Dear friends in Christ, today Jesus is doing the very same for you. He makes the first move. He comes to you even when we make outrageous demands, even when we fling what He's done in our lives in His face. He comes and stands among us and says, peace be with you. He does it through the gift He's given the church when you receive the absolution, which is why we share that peace after that part of the service. The forgiveness won by Jesus given to us faithfully week in and week out. Jesus always makes the first move. So you can lay those fears to rest. The little earthly fears that plague your mind. The great big cosmic fears that lead you to questions where you fear the outcome or answer. Any fear about the future is now laid to rest. Why? Because Christ is risen. That means death is defeated. That means your sins are forgiven. That means that Jesus is, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God. And as John closes this section in the gospel, that means that by believing in Him, you have life in His name.
This is your peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Amen.